Welcome back. It is illegal to gamble on a single sporting event in this country, which means that billions of dollars in gambling revenue floods offshore or into the underground economy. Now, gamblers are trying to pressure Ottawa to legalize that, pointing to a potential windfall in tax revenue. But as Rick Westhead investigates, they might want to be careful about what they wish for. Super Bowl Sunday, America's excuse to overeat, overdrink, and in some cases, overgamble. This isn't Las Vegas, it's a sports book, a betting bar in Secaucus, New Jersey, one of the first states to offer legal betting on individual games. Not only can you bet on outcomes, you can wager on individual situations within a game. They call them prop bets. And believe it or not, millions were riding on this. The coin flip. Now that single sport betting is legal, New Jersey can't seem to count the money fast enough. This is the best Super Bowl ever. From the Meadowlands to Atlantic City, Vegas has a new competitor. It's exceeded my expectations in terms of the excitement around betting on sports. Marcus Glover is president and COO of Borgata Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. I knew that there was excitement for sports wagering, but to see that there are ages, demographic, that you could never account for to be excited about placing a wager, we've seen it come through our doors. And in many regards, it's, it's knocking on the heels of uh, supplanting Las Vegas as the number one destination for sports wagering. It's hockey night at the Prudential Center in Newark. As the New Jersey Devils take the ice for warm-up, the concourse is filling up. In addition to the queues for hot dogs and popcorn, there are lineups of odds. It's something no one ever thought possible in the big four professional sports. Legalized sports wagering featuring two of the biggest players in the game, Caesars and William Hill, just steps away from where the game is actually being played. Well, we got a great offer. What do you got? We got Register, you get $10, then deposit match up to $150. Live professional sports and gambling now hand in hand. In 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, and that cleared the way for states to offer single game and in-game betting. New Jersey was the first state out of the gate, and it is clearly leading the pack. In just under a year and a half, more than $6 billion were wagered at sportsbooks, with revenues closing in on half a billion dollars. The New Jersey state government is the big winner, pulling in tax revenue of almost $54 million. New Jersey's done a great job. The regulators have done a fantastic job modernizing, um, looking at this, I think, in a really, in a partnership way with the industries. Thank you very much, Ms. Slane. Sarah Slane has been called the Pied Piper of legalized gambling in the United States. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We believe legal, transparent sports betting regulated by states and tribes is a better system than, pre than the previous federal ban that provided zero protections for consumers and sports integrity and zero tax revenues for governments at all levels. Since testifying before the U.S. Congress as VP of the American Gaming Association, Sarah Slane has watched legalized gambling in the U.S. explode. There are now 19 states offering legal gambling. Another four states have won approval, and nine others have active bills before state governments. I was just reading that statistic this morning and thinking to myself, my gosh, this is shocking, like just at the pace at which it moved. And I think it speaks to the fact that casinos have been in the United States now for 25 year plus. So it definitely has been a rising tide that lifts all boats. In New Jersey, online single game and propositional betting has become so popular that people are literally taking daily trips from New York City to Hoboken, pulling out their phones, making a bet, and then returning home across the Hudson. While gambling fever is taking off in the United States, Canada is still on the sidelines. Yes, we have ProLine and Sports Select, but single game and propositional bets are still illegal. There have been at least three private members' bills introduced in the House of Commons attempting to change the criminal code to give Canadians a piece of the legalized gambling market. 
the critics say, hold on, Canada should slow down and learn from the UK experience. Great Britain is a country that loves its wagers. You can bet on everything from the gender of the next royal child to who's going to score the first goal in the second half for your favorite football team. I've always loved football. I play it, I coached it, I managed it, I watched it. It was and is like all consuming over my life. But for James Grimes, his love for football took him down a dark path. He went from wearing his favorite team's colors and singing in the stands to wondering how he was going to pay for his next bet. He became one of at least 400,000 gambling addicts in the UK. I had no control over my um, addiction and football at the time. You could place a bet every five seconds, and I did. Nowhere is gambling more in your face in England than on the football pitch, and the beautiful game is making a handsome profit from the betting giants. Half of the 20 teams in the Premier League sport a gambling company logo on their shirts. The sponsorship deals pull in almost $600 million. Bet365.com. And that doesn't count the, the millions spent on television ads. The number of corners. It turned football into a casino game for me, and what made it even worse was that I then stopped believing that I actually liked football anymore and that I just liked betting on football, which was scary for someone that come through into this through the love of the game in the first place. What do you mean when you say you were making bets every five seconds? Um, what sort of things were you making bets? Anything and everything. Who will win the kickoff? There's first throw-in of the game, next corner, next goal, first goal scorer. Bet365 offer over 50 in-play markets. Even if I win one of those bets, I couldn't then just be happy and then watch the rest of the game in peace. I'd have to constantly put another bet on. So there's never moments of football games where I'd have no money on it. It would always be, I'd always have money risking. How much money do you figure that you lost from your habit? So I, in 12 years of addiction, I estimate I lost £100,000. The bet shops are seemingly on every corner in the smaller working class communities in England. Winning, and especially losing, is made very convenient. Well, we're here at a William Hill betting terminal in Sheffield, England. And at these terminals, you can bet on anything, and it's super easy. Any sport from football to horse racing and tennis, there's hockey. Not only can you bet on the NHL, you can bet on leagues in the Czech Republic, in Finland, in Germany, all around the world. And not only can you bet on the outcome of the game, you can bet on which team is going to score first, how many goals are going to be scored each period, literally anything. It was at one of these machines where James Grimes hit rock bottom. He celebrated his 28th birthday by losing $3,500 in just 25 minutes. I felt helpless, I felt desperate, I felt lonely, and I also started to realize it's affecting so many other people now that you know this is an inherently selfish thing to do and something needed to change. The damage is catastrophic. It's extraordinary to, to see and witness and, and you know work with families, work with individuals whose lives have in every single domain have completely collapsed. Matt Gaskell is a psychologist specializing in addiction. He runs the first of 14 gambling clinics scheduled to open in the UK, including a clinic specifically for addicted children. We've heard the phrase gambling addiction compared to heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a fair comparison? Addiction is addiction. The neuroscience is very similar. The way it acts on the brain is very similar. They describe a feeling of intoxication, of excitement, of anticipation, of calming, of escaping, of taking away from their problems, of what we call dissociating, tranquilizing effects. So I hear precisely the same things I hear in gambling. How would you describe the relationship between the betting industry and professional sports, particularly football in England? It's really changed. Rather than talking about, you know, tactics or your favorite players, the conversations now amongst football supporters is around betting. The radio programs have saturated conversations and, and adverts around uh, gambling. You've got the sponsorship. So really, sports ha are now kind of hand in glove with, with gambling. It's just seen as one in the same, almost. For James Grimes, it's a constant struggle to fight the gambling temptation as he walks the high street of his neighborhood before the pandemic. So set the scene, where are we in Manchester? Everywhere he looks are reminders of the gambling addiction he hopes he's left behind forever. 
It's a typical high street in a relatively poor area. You see three bookmakers in the space of like 50 to 100 yards. What would it be like for you to go back into these bedding shops? How easy would it be for you to fall back into some of the old destructive habits that you had? Too easy, and that, that's what deeply worries me. I guarantee if I walked in there that there'd be no checks, there'd be no verification. This is two minutes from my house. The working class steel town of Sheffield, England is similar to Manchester with a disproportionate number of neighborhood bet shops. And for another young man, just like James Grimes, the temptation was just too much. A local shop became a lunchtime and after school hangout for 17 year old Jack Ritchie and his pals. But what started as a seemingly harmless activity quickly became a full blown addiction. His parents, Liz and Charles, recall how it all started for their son. Jack began gambling when he was in school. Liz, do you want to tell me a little bit about how he was introduced to gambling? There was a betting shop very close to school, as there are on the high streets all over Britain. He and a big group of his friends used to go out uh, at lunchtime and gamble with their dinner money. So, you know, they'd gamble with a couple of pounds, which, and sometimes they'd have their lunch and sometimes they wouldn't. And he met with some early success. Yes, he won 500 pounds on s twice successive spins. So as a 17 year old, he came home with a thousand pounds in cash, which we didn't know about. Once Jack got a taste of winning, his gambling ramped up. A year after his first win, he confessed to his parents that not only had he lost the 1000 pounds he initially won, but also money his grandmother had gifted him. He felt terrible about it. You know, he felt really he bad upset, what he had done. Upset. He was really, really upset. We just thought it was, you know, something that he, you know, something that young boys do and that he would grow out of it. I suspect when Jack, well, no, we know that when Jack first told us, he was already addicted. He was already on the path to, to, to struggling with this for the rest of his life. Coming up. Let's you decide which odds you want to boost. Should Canada go all in on sports betting? We've legalized a lot of different things. We haven't gone to hell in a handbasket. When W5 continues. Legalize sports betting in the palm of your hand. A Supreme Court challenge has cleared the way for legalized single sport and propositional betting in the United States, and so far the bet has paid off. More than half the United States have cleared the way for legal betting, with state governments cashing in with tax revenues off the charts. But for every big win, there are large losses. <laughs> These were happier times for Jack Ritchie and his mom. <laughs> Growing up in Sheffield, England, Jack began gambling at an early age during his lunch break at school. It started as a fun activity, but it didn't take long for it to become a full-blown addiction. He wasn't sleeping, and I suppose, again, I thought that this is a crisis time coming into adulthood, and what he needs is some therapy. And I didn't know. I, you know, if he'd been taking drugs, I would have known. Betting on sports consumed Jack Ritchie. It's all he could think about as he struggled with his gambling habit for years. He eventually took a job in Vietnam teaching English and loved it. His parents were confident the change of scenery was going to be a fresh start for him. We, we got an email from him um, basically saying, um, the old problem's back and I'm not coming back from this one. Um, he he he'd, he'd posted something on Facebook at the same time, which was a, 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 you know, a selfie of himself and um, and a few words, which kind of you know, which we could see was was that he was going to take his own life, and he'd attached a suicide in, note in his email to us. Jack was just 24 years old. He took his own life, thousands of miles from home. It was an unreal situation to be you know, on the phone to people in Vietnam trying to find out if your son's dead. And he was. It's estimated that as many as 650 addicted gamblers take their lives every year in the UK. 
According to Britain's National Health Service, there are 400,000 addicted gamblers in the UK. Another 2 million are at risk. Of more concern, the number of children classified as having a gambling problem has quadrupled to more than 59,000 in the last two years. Gambling is now, it is normalized. Once Charles and Liz Ritchie got over the shock of their son's death, they got angry. And they began wondering if they were alone. How many other sons and daughters were pushed to death by gambling? So we, we started trawling the local newspapers, um, the uh, um, coroner's courts. And we found, crikey, it must have been 40 or 50 um, reports of deaths. And so we tried to contact some of those families. The Ritchies formed an organization called Gambling With Lives. Its mission is to provide support for grief-stricken families like them and to lobby the government for stronger regulations on the gambling industry. The bereaved families shared their stories in a video PSA. My son went into, into the woods where he took his life. It was a nasty death and it was a, it, it was something you weren't, sorry. In addition to producing videos with families who were still in mourning, Liz and Charles took their message directly to the British government. There's no warning, there's no health warning. You know, a six-year-old knows that smoking kills. Who knows that gambling kills? How many parents have I spoken to crying to me on the phone who said, I warned, I warned him about road safety, I warned him about drugs, um, I warned him about sexual predators. Nobody's warning about the other predator yeah. that's out there. Very big point. The British government appears to be listening. It recently cracked down on fixed odd betting terminals, limiting the amount that can be bet from 100 pounds to just two pounds a spin. The new limits saw the closure of 700 bet shops. The National Health Service has opened more clinics, and advertising for gambling companies has been limited during television broadcasts of games. Bet Boost lets you decide which odds you want to boost. Despite the soaring addiction rate in the UK and the mounting number of suicides related to gambling, legalized sports gambling is spreading like wildfire in the United States, and some in Canada now want a piece of the action. I think Canadians from coast to coast to coast should have the opportunity to do what a lot of Americans are doing currently in the United States. They should have an opportunity to bet on single games. You're listening to The Rush with Ryan Doyle and Jay Mad Dog Michaels okay. on News Talk 1010. When he's not hosting an afternoon radio show in Toronto, Ryan Doyle has been known to bet on the odd sporting event. He wants Canada to follow Britain and America's lead. It's not going to turn into Sodom and Gomorrah. We've legalized a lot of different things. We've legalized marijuana in the last couple of years. We haven't gone to hell in a handbasket. Here in Canada, we have casinos that border a lot of these American states, and they're eating our lunch. You're going to have job losses, and if we don't do something when it comes to single-game wagering, these casinos are going to close. And that's exactly the concern that Brian Massey has. The NDP MP represents Windsor West, the casino in his riding is just a stone's throw from Michigan, where legalized single-game betting is now up and running. He says if Canada doesn't legalize single-sport gambling, jobs will be lost. We need to protect our jobs here, provide a proper system of accountability and regulation for something that wants to be in part of our society uh, and to deal with that. Massey says, much like the legalization of cannabis, the federal government has an opportunity to cash in on an underground market that isn't going away anytime soon. This recent gambling bust north of Toronto pulled in $131 million in cash and merchandise obtained from outlawed gaming. It's estimated $10 billion a year goes to organized crime. So the legalization of sports betting would be a work. Saskatoon Conservative MP Kevin Waugh is the latest to introduce a bill calling for legalized sports betting. Between Massey and Waugh, this is the third attempt to change the criminal code. By supporting my private member's bill, C-218. Well, we're kind of uh, in the backwater. Um, many countries, including the United States uh, and Europe, have moved um, towards having a regulated industry and open in the regular um, you know, systems of betting. If we don't do this, we are basically handcuffing our casino and other types of operators for tourism related to this. 
Sports gambling right now in Canada is run by the provinces. You see it in convenience stores under the brand name ProLine or Sports Select. If you play, you already know that you're limited by what you can wager on. So in Canada, you have to bet on multiple events to collect a win. Can you just help me understand a little bit about how that works? Let's say it was the Super Bowl between the Chiefs and the 49ers. Well, okay, now we've got a 50-50 shot at me winning that bet or you winning that bet. In Ontario, the government tells me I have to bet that game, but I also have to bet an NHL game and maybe a second NHL game in order to actually make a profit. That's the house controlling the system and getting a bigger advantage on me, the gambler. You know, it is a rigged system. Let's just call it for what it is. They're selling a hope and a dream that doesn't exist because with those odds, eventually you're going to lose. You're going to give your money away. Back in the UK, the Ritchie family understand the appeal of convenient gaming. We're, we're not anti-gambling. We're not anti-betting. But they warn that Canada should tread carefully. I would say to Canadian parents, don't allow your politicians to believe the gambling companies. They're grooming the whole uh, political class to, to say this is OK. It isn't OK. Because the reality is young people will be addicted and some of them will die. It's not a question of will this happen. It will happen. When Parliament was prorogued, that put the brakes on the single sports betting bill. Gamblers will have to try their luck in the new session of Parliament. <laughs>